Our way of life that we have as Americans comes at a cost. Name's Roland Vandenberg. I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps in 2001, and I was medically retired in 2016, and I uh, retired as a staff sergeant. So I was born in Inglewood, California. Uh, my father, he was, uh, he grew up in South Central LA, Florence and Bud Long, a block away from where the LA riots were. And, uh, you know, white dude in the hood, like he had a, he had a rough upbringing. Wow. He's ridiculous stories that he's told me about his upbringing. And I think as a father, he didn't want that for his kids. So my parents um, moved way the hell out to a place called Lake Los Angeles. There's no lake. Uh, I, don't know, <laughs> I don't know where it got the name. Like it's just in the middle of the desert. Uh, there's a dry lake bed. I don't know if there was development plans and they ran out of money, but yeah. there's, there's no lake. Um, there's nothing out there. Like if you were to go out there now, all you would see is a bunch of meth labs and like, you know, no, no offense to anyone that lives in Lake LA, yeah. but uh, it's just, yeah. Was, was, he, was he living in uh, uh, South Central during the riot? He, um, he was not, we were already moved out by then. My cousins uh, were actually there. I have cousins that were there during the riots. They were actually heavily involved in it. Like one went to, one went to jail for actions that had happened during the riots. Like mm. he was there on the corner of Florence and Normandy when Reginald Denny, the, the truck driver, got mm. freaking stomped and ripped out of his truck. So that was brutal. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, that's yeah. It it, it was yeah, total, rough upbringing for sure. You know, growing up in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the desert, me and my brother got really tight because there's there's really nothing to do. So we would BMX bike in the freaking desert and we would we would play football with some of the kids on the street. Every it was like every evening we'd be out in the street playing ball. Me and my brother were like best friends. And um is as I got older, we moved out to a place called Palmdale, which is still out in the middle of nowhere, but not in the sticks like at Lake LA. Um, and when I was a freshman in high school, I, I really got into hanging out with the wrong crowd. I hung out with this like party crew at the time where that's all they were about is partying, getting in trouble. And I ended up getting kicked out of multiple high schools. I, I almost went to every high school in the area that I was from because I just couldn't last. I got into fights, I stole shit. Like it was, yeah, it, it was bad. And I think my parents noticed it and they had to pull the plug immediately. And they sent me to this high school called, it was, it was Highland, Not, nothing crazy. It was just highly regarded for the wrestling program and their sports. And looking back, I think that's really what saved my life, like getting involved in sports because when you compete athletically, it takes you out of that place where you're hanging out with the wrong crowd and getting into trouble because you're mainly focused on just being the best. Yeah. And that's what really helped me. And um, you know, a, a big part of where I am today, in addition to you know the United States Marine Corps, there was this big massive party at this place called the arena in Hollywood. And we're like, dude, this is gonna be sick. Like we get there, um, the music's bumping. And, and like we walk in, we're like, dude, this is sick. Five minutes walking in and I'm like looking around. I'm like, dude, I don't see any women here. Like, oh, there's some right there. Oh, but she looks kind of like, uh, looks kind of like a dude <laughs> and, and this is this is before like this whole like transgender thing and everything came out this was like back the 90s in, yeah in the 90s in the late 90s so it's like and i'm like this just seems a little off and then out of nowhere i feel someone just kind of rub on my shoulder and i like look and it's this big like 200 pound like husky dude wearing mascara in a wig and he's like hey poppy what are you doing here and i'm like no we went on gay night we went on gay night <laughs> to the arena and uh that was the last time i've ever gone to the arena <laughs> yeah so yeah nothing 
nothing too crazy and eventful. We we did a lot of partying, but I joined the military. So I always I always wanted to serve the military. I just wanted to to be a part of something bigger than myself, and I really appreciated what we had. It, it was like just very. Um, I was just very aware that our way of life that we have is Americans comes at a cost. And it's, it's a cost that I wanted to stand up and bear. And um, I still remember the very, the very day, my daddy was working for the movie studios. He was working on a show called Arliss, sports agent show. And he brought back this, uh, and those Marines that might remember this, they remember this photo, it was like this decked out, Marine Corps dude, green woodland, full, full spec gear, like just looked like a fucking badass and uh, with the Marines on top. And my dad brought this home to me and I was like, I took one look at it and I'm like, that's it. That's, that's what I want to do. I want to be a Marine. And uh, what's funny is my dad's the one that brought that back when it came down to me enlisting. He didn't want to sign for me to enlist in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. He wanted me to join the Air Force. <laughs> and I was like, Dad, come on, how are you going to bring some shit like this home and encourage me to do this? And then like, oh, psych, son, like join the Air Force. <laughs> He's like, you, like he, he served in the Air Force and he would tell me all, all these stories about like how we would go to the chow hall and they would serve steak and lobster. And he's like, you want to rough it out there in the field when you can have a nice desk in an air conditioned building? And little did he know he was selling me because I didn't want any of that. Wow. Like, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's crazy. So I enlisted in 2001, July of 2001. I, I joined the delayed entry program and that was my senior year in high school. Um, I joined the Marine Corps, like my plan, I was a huge football athlete. I was outside linebacker, best in, in my area in Southern section. And my goal was to play football in college, and, but I still wanted to serve. So I joined the reserves and then little did I know, 9-11 uh, happened. So 9-11 mm -hmm. happened while I was in boot while camp. Was it. Oh, back up a little bit, what, yeah. was your, what was your recruiting experience like? Yeah, so my recruiting experience was was kind of short. Um, I was in the late entry program maybe for like three, four months. Um, I was in really good shape already. I was coming off like football and a track season. So I didn't need to really prepare too much for boot camp. Um, so I, I enlisted, smooth recruiting process. Um, I got exactly what I wanted. Uh, I. My goal was to join the reserves. I got an infantry contract and, um, and yeah, before I know it, like I graduated and I was in boot camp weeks later. Boot camp was tough for me. Like I'll, I was a diet recruit. So I'm like, I'm a big dude right now. I'm, but I'm, I'm very low body fat. And I was like that coming at high school. I was an outside linebacker. I was 220 pounds. Um, you know, 18% body fat. The problem is in boot camp, they didn't go off of your body fat. It was just height and weight. Mm -hmm. So my weight for my height at 72 inches was like 180 pounds. I was 40 pounds overweight. So I was a nasty fat body to them. So boot camp in itself was challenging. Like every time I, I felt like my body was just eating itself. Like going into breakfast, I'd have my, the very first time I had my tray, I'd get some like cocoa pebbles, some bananas, all this stuff. And then I'd get to my drill instructor and be like, uh-uh, take it off, take it off, take it off. And I was like, dude, it got so damn, I, I, would, I would take the Peter Pan peanut butter packets, I'd slide them in my cargo pocket when, when no one was looking. And then late at night when I'm lying in bed, I'd be like, all right, is, is, anyone, uh, is anyone awake? And then uh, I'd, I'd go and have my <laughs> evening feast. That's how bad it got. And, and, so, and then it gets worse. So like we're at field week up in, up in Pendleton and um, we had right before we went out to the field, they issued us all MREs out the night before. They put them out on the wall locker. I mean, the foot locker, not wall locker. And uh, I'm looking at them, I'm like, dude, I'm hungry as hell and I don't have any peanut butter. <laughs> so I was like, what's the worst that can happen if I bust open that MRE? Fuck it, like I'll, I'll deal with the repercussions later. And then, um, so me and my rack mate, like we, we opened it, we went to town, freaking M&Ms, like, 
uh, dude, the chili mac. I got the chili mac one, so you know it was a good night. Yeah. And uh, and then afterwards, I eat, and then I'm like, fuck. Then I'm thinking about what am I gonna do? Like, what am I gonna tell the drill instructors? Well, we had this shitty recruit. Everyone hated. We all got fucked up in haze from this damn recruit, recruit England. I still remember his name. He'd be the dude that would put the boots on wrong feet, his trousers on backwards. He, we would just get slayed because of the mistakes that he made. And he was a buddy, like major blue falcon, bro. Like, and we're like, all right, I got an idea. Let's take our empty containers and then put them, switch them out with recruit England's. And then, and then, so the next morning comes, drill instructors are doing their inspections, they're walking by and they just stop. And he's all recruiting Lynn. Like, what the fuck? And he looked like he saw a ghost because it, he didn't have any idea why that even happened. And I'm like, dude, I got so nervous. My heart's like beating in my chest. Major integrity violator. I, yeah, I'm not proud of this, but, uh, but yeah. I rem so one of the other rack mates, just happened to be awake and saw us do that. So the freaking dude wrote a little note and then slid it under the duty hut oh, door. Oh, he then, ratted you Yeah, he ratted, ratted us out. And next thing I know, like I hear, recruit Vandenberg, recruit Vandenberg. Yes, senior drill instructor. And our senior drill instructor is so, this crazy, and this sounds made up, but it's totally not. His name was Sergeant Sancho. And Sergeant Sancho, fit, freaking fit ass black dude, gold tooth. And uh, he was very smooth, but you didn't want to get on his bad side because that would switch in a moment's notice. And then you would just hear him wreak havoc. So he's super calm and he's like, hey, you got something to tell us? And I'm like, no, senior drill instructor. Like, and he's all whispered to me too, you nasty thing. Like, and then I was like, oh shit, shit's about to get real. He's off. You better hope that your parents don't come to your graduation because I'm going to tell them how much of a fuck up and a piece of shit you are for what you just did. You're an integrity violator. Not only did you, not only are you a fat piece of shit, but you tried to put it off on another recruit. So don't worry. I'm, I'm going to take care of you. I hate that you're hungry and we don't, we don't do a good job at uh, feeding you and keeping your stomach full. So I'm gonna make sure we take care of that. Skip Chow the next morning, and, uh, or that morning, we skip Chow, and he takes me back to the, to the quarter deck. And he's like, hey, go get your canteens, and uh, go fill them up. All right, start drinking, hydrating. And I'm like, canteen after canteen, back to back. And he's all, his stomach's full? And I was like, yes, senior. He's all, nah, I don't think so. Go fill them up again. And uh, canteen after canteen, I'm, I'm like down to like three canteens now. And he's like, all right, side throttle hops, burpee mountain climbers, Ooh. just hazes me. And then uh, I just, I, dude, puked right there on the quarter deck. And like right there on the quarter deck, he's like, oh no, no. Now your stomach is empty, go fill them up. We can't have that. So he, he, it was like, um, I've never been so hydrated before in my life. And, <laughs> And, uh, but I remembered, and then uh, I did a tour, like he had me tour every different platoon. And I would go see that senior drill instructor for every platoon. He said, you're gonna do a tour of Camp Pendleton, a tour of Edson Range. And like, it, I, it was creative the way drill instructors worked me out. They had me do this thing called the crucifix where I'd have two Kevlar helmets. I'd lift them up off the ground and then have one in between my feet and I had to lay there and uh, I've never felt my body burn so much in my life. Like it was, but so yeah, it was, uh, that was the most memorable boot camp story. Actually, when it finished, he brought me in and he's like, hey, I'm, I'm proud of you that you didn't quit. And he's all like, you know what? Here's some Doritos. And I'm like, oh shit, that's dope. So he's all, go ahead, open them. And go ahead, open them. I'm like, all right, fuck it, all right. So I, I open the bag of Doritos. I, I take a bite. He's all, those are good, huh? And then uh, he goes out, walks out the door, and he's all like, Sergeant McGuire! And that's the kill hat. The, the oh, marine the that belt. hazes, the green belt that hazes, hazes recruits. And uh, he's all, come over here. He's all, are those your Doritos that Vandenberg's eating? And he's just like, he, he looks at me, he's like, oh, you're gonna pay. From that day on, 
Every time a recruit got messed up on the quarter deck in the pit, I was his buddy. <laughs> so needless to say, I graduated boot camp 180 pounds. And I, I mean, I looked like a starving Ethiopian kid. Like that's how skinny I was. I originally joined in the reserves, 9-11 happened. Our reserve unit got mobilized immediately. And then we deployed to Iraq for the initial invasion. So wow. we were attached to RCT-1. Um, I was an infantry Marine and then they, they cross-trained me. Um, I was a rifleman in 0311, but we had a huge need for machine gunners. So then I went back to machine gun school, got that secondary MOS. We went to Kuwait, stayed in Kuwait for about, you know, 30 days, just get ready. And then I, I still remember uh, President Bush, he gave Saddam that timeline, 48 hours to surrender, give yourself up or we're coming in. And we waited that 40 hours down, 48 hours down to the minute. And uh, once that minute hit, the trucks hit it. And uh, Man, I still remember the very first battle zone that we went through. It was An Nazaria, uh, Battle of An Nazaria. And um, we were, it was like 3 a.m., pitch black. We had all the vehicles staged on the road and we were waiting for the airstrike. And looking at that airstrike, pitch black, it, the, I've never experienced anything in my life. It was actually pretty damn cool, to be honest. Yeah. Um, the sky just lit up, just bombs dropping. And we knew as soon as that airstrike was over, you know, it's, it's wheels up, we're, we're, we're going in. And we were, we were like right in the middle of the convoy. So when we got up to that first block, Marines were laid out both sides of the street, putting rounds down range, both directions. We had Cobras fall, like flying over our shoulder. Like it was picturesque, like we were in a movie. And um, I still remember the very, the very first shots that I took up from a balcony. And I'm like, oh shit. At this point, like, the, all fear is gone. The adrenaline's going and I'm just like having my head on a swivel, hoping I don't get fucking shot. And I remember the pop shots, dude coming up with an AK over the balcony and then dip right down. And uh, I, turned, I was on a 240 Gulf uh, 762 machine gun and uh, I just lit up just the whole freaking, you know, it's wood, uh, like, like mud, mud adobe. Mm. And I just put all those rounds right through there. There was a track on the corner that saw me shooting at him. Then he, then he lit him up with a 40 mic mic. And so <laughs> that dude was gone for sure. If I didn't get him with 762, he was for sure obliterated. That was my very first experience as a 19 year old like talk about growing up really quick. So when we got up to Baghdad, that was, um, that was a, an experience that I'll, I'll never forget. It was actually one of the things that I've had some of the most trouble dealing with. We, were, we got up to the Republican Guard headquarters and uh, our line companies were going to clear, uh, to clear the buildings, clear the headquarters. So we set up a perimeter, a perimeter outside the building and um, I was on the machine gunner, focus on the main uh, entry control point, and uh, it's freaking summer in Iraq, 140 degrees. It's so damn hot that you can't even drink water because the water's scolding and sweat is dripping down. It's like just hell. Like you literally felt like you were in hell. Mm -hmm. And um, Marines were getting lax, and then you could just tell because we're out there for hours and then we got hit by RPG fire. So they lit up our seven ton trucks with RPGs. We saw the enemy, they fleed in what I believe it was like a taxi. Like they, they drove these taxis, the orange cars, orange in the front and back, white in the middle, and then they just boned out. They took off in a taxi. And so we called it up down the chain, let them know. A couple hours went by and um, out of nowhere, we have this taxi car that's approaching us. And at this point, like the Marines that were on that front entry control point, I don't know if they were just getting lackadaisical, but they were, they were off their game. And by the time that they noticed the car that was approaching, it was too late. They, they gave it orders to stop and um, it wouldn't stop. And at that point, I just remember hearing an explosion, which looking back, it might've been, you know, a, a Mark 19, that maybe they trip, we have no idea. But once that explosion hit, 
I freaking lit up a full belt of 762 in that car. We had Marines from all different angles shooting and that car probably had 600 rounds in it. And um, it was a family. Oh, it was a family, man. It's, it, um, yeah, it like, that was tough. Wow. Um, and that was like, I very rarely have told this story. Um, that was some of my, like one of my biggest things, like the guilt that I've, that I've felt um, of, you know, going through and dealing with that. And it wasn't until I, I learned to tell the story and get it off my chest that I learned to tell it in a different perspective. Cause I've always like held on to that with just tons of guilt. I've kept it bottled up inside, shouldered it. And it wasn't until someone told me that, man, you were just doing what you were trained to do. And imagine if you didn't take action and they shouldn't have been there in the first place. They shouldn't have been approaching a Marine Corps unit when we're at a state of war. But imagine if you didn't do that and you didn't take action and that was a vehicle born IED and it just freaking killed your unit of 20 Marines that were mm -hmm. there. Imagine the guilt that you yeah. feel then. And it really just shifted my perspective. You know, when you experience those, those memories and you can't unexperience them. Mm -hmm. And you know, you have certain smells that, certain actions, certain things that you hear, certain smells like the burning rubber and this combination of burning stuff immediately takes me back to Iraq in, in deployment, you know, and mm -hmm. it, it's crazy. So, and it, it's, it's a work in progress, man. I'm, I'm not perfect. I'll, I'll never be perfect, but I do my best to, to try to, to grow from it. And I know I'm in a way better place than I once yeah. was. After we fully secured the Republican Guard headquarters, I was put on the front gate. And then um, immediately, like that afternoon, we started taking sniper fire. And I'm like, I'm literally like in the front and I have rounds like just, I have no idea where they're coming from. And they're like feet like hit, just hitting the deck. And I'm like, just trying to take cover, trying to get an angle of uh, where, where the shots are coming from. And uh, we sent out a sniper team and they took them out, you know, that day. But so later on, like um, we had some locals that were coming to the gate and the locals, they loved MREs, like to the point where like when we were driving up all the way up through Baghdad, we'd have kids, we'd have guys that would jump out in front of the trucks wanting food. So we like, we channeled our like inner Peyton Manning. I would like get it back and then just chuck it as hard as I could where they'll, they'll get the MRE, but they're gonna fall on their ass like if they wanna get in front of our trucks. But so we had some, some locals that came up to the gate and they were like, hey, I got a bottle of scotch. Like I'll trade you for an MRE. So we made that trade and uh, it, was, it was actually my, platoon sergeant that made the call. At the time, I'm, I'm like a PFC or Lance Corporal. So if, if, if my sergeant and my corporal said is good, it's good. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna listen to my leadership. So we, uh, that night, we had our shifts on the front gate and then we, we sat around together and we drank scotch um, in Baghdad, which was a, a crazy memorable experience. Like probably stupid as hell considering we took sniper fire that afternoon, but we were, we were pretty toasty and we had our canteens that were filled up. Here's what's crazy is my best, one of my best friends going through high school, um, he ended up showing up in Baghdad at that compound. He was a truck driver. This is the first time I've seen him since high school. And I, I'm like, dude, what the fuck are you doing here? In back, he's I, I enlisted, bro, right after you. Like, the, your, your recruiter hit me up and said, Oh, you want to be like Roland and then join the Marine Corps? Wow. Yeah. So he, I was like, Dude, I got something for you. I handed him the canteen and he took a swig and he about choked. <laughs> he spit it out, and, but he's like, All right, dude, I needed this. So we get pretty toasted. Later on that night, 3 a.m., he gets woken up. And he has to take the commanding general up to division. <laughs> and he's driving a seven ton truck 
in a time of war with he he could have gotten court-martialed we still joke around to this day like you motherfucker you almost got me court-martialed because you want to give me some freaking sky <laughs> so yeah so damn funny during the invasion of iraq like you see all this shit on the news like it's all the crazy shit it's it's like troops kicking indoors shit blowing up but if i were to look back and and really describe it like i would explain it is hours and hours of boredom mixed in with moments of sheer terror. So when you go through that, the hours of boredom, it, that's where you, you build that camaraderie because we're all in chaos together. We're in hell together and it builds an unbreakable bond. I still like those, it, it, it just gave me goosebumps, man. I still like in tight with those Marines I serve with today. Um, one of them's my business partner now, yeah. and it's 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 crazy. But I remember during the downtime, there were little things like I had this. Uh, he's a sergeant major now, Sergeant Major Morelos. He actually had see at the time we didn't have iPods, so there Apple wasn't a thing. We had Discmans. So I remember Morelos, freaking dude from uh, Silmar, San Fernando Valley. He had someone sent him. Uh, a Chente CD, a Vicente Fernandez. Mm. I'm a white, I don't, I don't really know Mexican. Um, I don't know Spanish, like Mexican music, like, mm. but that shit sounded good. <laughs> it sounded good to me. I'm yeah, like, yeah. we're bumping El Rey in Baghdad and it just, it takes you back, man. It, it takes you back and gives you a sense of peace and tranquility in chaos. And let me tell you, that's like one of my favorite songs now. Like El Rey by, by, by the goat Vicente is like, Dude, it, it immediately takes me back. I love that jam. Yeah. And it's little moments like that where we make a makeshift gym out of sandbags and MRE boxes and keep ourselves fit and in shape and do it together. It, um, yeah, it builds a crazy bond that, yeah. that I'll never forget. Absolutely. So Afghanistan, that was, um, man, that was a, that was a rough deployment. Um, mainly just for... It was a rough deployment because, uh, you know, I lost some, like we had lost some good Marines that I knew that I was very close to. So um, I was transitioned over to the, uh, to the advisor team. So I trained the Afghan National Army and, and we put a course together for them and, you know, tried to make them more proficient. But my, my company that I was previously with, I had a, uh, a team leader, uh, Jonathan Taylor, that was the ideal freaking Marine. I remember the very first day that I checked in to 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines, I, uh, I went and saw the, the first sergeant, Company Gunny, and they're giving me orders. Uh, you know, Taylor at the time, Corporal Taylor, I, you know, he'd, he'd be listening in, and that Marine that would initially, like immediately take initiative and just get it, get it done. By the time I got to the platoon, he's all, it's all taken care of, sergeant. Like he's that Marine, mm -hmm. um, a Marine that any squad leader would be blessed to have. And uh, February, we got there in January, February, he was on a night patrol, stepped on an IED, killed instantly. And, uh, you know, that was the beginning of the deployment. Mm -hmm. Then the last of deployment. So I had a, uh, a really good friend of mine, like my best friend over there, like... Yeah, he was a uh, Joseph Garrison. Like uh, he lived with me, and uh, you know we were roommates. Um, my wife at the time had introduced him to like one of her best friends. They got engaged, and we were just really tight, man. Um, he was that he was that Marine that looked out for his Marines more than anyone I've ever seen. Like you know, at the time he was that he would go out you know, party with his Marines, but still kept it professional. But when it came down to the very next day, like if the Marines were late, he was that one that would tell First Sergeant, hey, First Sergeant, it's, it's my fault. Like I had the Marines, uh, you know, working on some things over at the barracks. Little did he know that they were just getting up from the night before, but he would take the brunt of everything. Mm -hmm. And he'd let the Marines have it, you know, behind closed doors. But when it came to the command, he always took the backlash, whatever, whatever he could bear. And uh, that's the type of Marine he was. 
and we were in Marja province, the Taliban stronghold at the time. They were patrolling out of patrol base McElhaney, and um, he was with Fox Company. They were troops in contact every single day. They were getting shot at, and uh, he was on a patrol, um, and his point man had the, the CMD, the combat mine detector, and he got a positive read on the mine detector. And our tactics and procedures at the time was as soon as we got a positive read on the mine detector, you were supposed to do a finger sweep technique to confirm that there's in fact an IED before you call explosive ordnance disposal to take care of it. So of course the type of Marine he is, he always wants to, to shield his Marines from harm. So what he did, he pushed his Marines back about 50 yards. Um, it wasn't a pressure plate IED. It was a remote control mm -hmm. IED. When he pushed his Marines back, we had an a piece of equipment called the Warlock that would jam radio control frequencies. So when he was pushing his Marines back to protect them, he was removing his protection, detonated the IED and mm -hmm. blew him up. Wow. Yeah, that was uh, that's the type of movie he was. But I know, like today, he would want that story told mm. if we were here today, because I think that's what we all want. Um, we just don't want to be forgotten. Yeah, and he'll never be forgotten. Yeah, after that, like I was, I was just ready for a change of scenery. On one of my other deployments, we were going to the west coast of Africa, like we were. The, the mission was to go to several countries on the West Coast and, uh, you know, to build our, our relationships, to train their, their, their armies and build their proficiency. Um, on the way there, the, earth, the earthquake in Haiti happened, so we we're the closest one. So that's when President Obama he called us in and we, had, you know, we provided humanitarian aid and support to, to Haiti. Um, and that was crazy. It was, it, that was actually my funnest deployment. Um, not from Haiti, because that place was the worst that, worse than Iraq, worse than Afghanistan, that place was fucked up. They were, they were, that place was messed up well before the earthquake. Um, but it was quite, it, it was, it was kind of fulfilling to be able to provide aid and help. One of the things I remember that deployment was when we went to Liberia and Liberia, complete poverty, like disease stricken country, like just, just a, a place that you really didn't want to deploy to. But we were at their base that was right on the coast. And if you didn't know where you were at, you would almost think that you were in Hawaii, like tropical paradise, a lagoon, um, a, a beautiful beach. And um, so that when we started training them, we were teaching them McMap. Well, we were doing uh, infantry patrolling classes and then Marine Corps martial arts. So the funny thing about like them is we'd, we'd wake up in the morning, we take them through some morning McMap, and then we would break for lunch at 11. Well, after lunch, I don't know if they got the itis or something, they just did not want to come back to work. So we were done at 11 o'clock every morning for the whole month we were there. So it, I felt like we were on vacation. We would walk across the lagoon and go chill on the beach every day. Wow. And uh, it was just, it was, a, it was a pretty awesome experience. Like nice. we didn't know till we got back on the ship we shouldn't have been in those waters because there were about 400 sharks. Like oh. they gave us an aerial picture of all the damn sharks that were in that water. It's off the coast of Africa. That's where great whites are too. Yeah. Like, yeah, we, yeah, that could have, that oh, could have gone wow. down south real quick. But that's, that's uh, one of the memories that I have on yeah. one of my non-combat deployments. Nice. Yeah. Um, talk to me about transition, man. What was it like yeah. transitioning out of the Marine Corps for you? Man, transitioning, uh, Transitioning was tough. Um, I came back from the deployment to Afghanistan, went on recruiting duty, which recruiting duty was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done in the Marine Corps, probably harder than combat. Like, it's just, it's the daunting duty. Much respect to all the men and women who are military recruiters. Um, it is a stress that just never goes away. You know, it's always, no matter what you accomplish, it doesn't matter what you've accomplished, what are you gonna accomplish now? And uh, it never goes away. And 
crazy work schedule. I was working 60, 60 hour weeks, seven days a week. I was commuting multiple ways and you know, my marriage was falling apart. Like, and then I had a back injury where my back just completely went out. I had to get a disc cut out of my back. And then I was, I was forced to, you know, medically retire early at 15 years. And, but it came so abruptly, it wasn't planned. So I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. I couldn't PT. I started to gain a shit ton of weight. Um, my whole life was just crumbling down literally in front of me and I didn't know what I was going to do. And, um, you know, in the Marine Corps, everything is taken care of for you. Your, your, your housing, your, your meals, everything. You have a staff sergeant, a first sergeant that completely guides you of what you want to accomplish, what you need to do. It keeps you in line, tells you what you should spend your money on, what you shouldn't spend your money on. Well, you leave and that goes away. You're on your own. Mm -hmm. And, um, there's no first sergeant, you know, there's no staff sergeant. So that was challenging. And, uh, but I had a, a, you know, great support and took me out of a dark spot that I was in. I remember there's a gentleman named Andy Frisella and um, there was a podcast that someone turned me on to. Little did they know that they were helping me. They, they could have been, you know, possibly saving my life. When I heard that podcast, it really sank in like, what the fuck are you doing? You know, you need to really pick yourself up. You know, you have, you have a family that depends on you. You have kids that look up to you. And um, this was when I was transitioning out because I was on terminal leave. I was going through surgeries, a lot of medical. Mm. So it was on my, on my retirement, my medical ward, it, it was almost a year long. Okay. Because I had a surgery rehab process. So I was in some dark spots and... Yeah, so little by little, you know, I, I, I got reconnected with the Marine that I served with on my very first deployment to Iraq. And um, we started building a business together, little by little. And that took me to where I'm at today. Like, and, but everything that I've done, I would do it all over again. And getting out, there were, yeah, there definitely were some mental health uh, issues like whether it's like survivor's guilt, survivor's guilt, like reliving like experiences in service because you can't forget them. You can't unexperience them. And with the VA, their mental health, like the few interactions I had with the mental health professional, I felt like it was a medical professional that, you know, that really didn't get me. They, they don't know like, I felt like I was being judged and whether I was or not, like it, that's just how it felt. And it was just really hard for me to get any, any growth, any progress on that. And a lot of it was, I kept it bottled inside because I didn't trust this person. Like they didn't get me. So why am I going to, mm -hmm. why am I going to tell all the stuff that I've been through? They wouldn't get me. They look at me like I'm freaking crazy. And, um, it wasn't until I, I, got with an organization called Merging Vets and Players where we surround ourselves with like-minded warriors who have been there and done that. And being able to share with each other, uh, it, it, that's where I truly had growth. And I, I got past to just being able to tell that story that I shared with you earlier. Mm -hmm. I never really told that story until then. Mm -hmm. And now like, yeah, it's, I've, I'm night and day from yeah. where I was. Nice. There was a time, so there was a time in, in, you know, when I was transitioning out, like, as I said, like my whole, everything was crumbling down on me. I had my military career just abruptly ended. I'm forced to retire. That wasn't planned. I had a life-changing back surgery that changed the way I function. I couldn't work out, I gained weight. My marriage is just falling apart. And um, it was in that moment that I had these, and looking back, it's crazy to think that, but I was just fucked up. And I had these thoughts like, man, I think it would be better if people just missed me. Like, that's what I was thinking. Like, it'd be so much better if I was just missed. 
And I remember this drive coming back from the recruiting station, two hour drive from Thousand Oaks, California to Palmdale. And there's this stretch on the 14 freeway that there's just mountains and hills around you. And I remember having thoughts of, man, I should just drive my car off the side and then at least I'll be missed, you know? Yeah, I was rough. Yeah. And then in that very moment, that was when I remember being turned on to a, a podcast that it was the MFCEO project by Andy Frisella. And I listened to it and it, it just talked some sense into me. It forced me to wake the hell up. Yeah, so now, um, so I'm, uh, I'm the owner and co-founder of Romeo Echo USA. Uh, we started, we started as a, as a real estate company. It's just evolved into someone, something so much bigger. And uh, it came through like the, the process of me buying a home. I, was, I used this program where we were, we were referred to an agent. It was to, like through USAA and they referred us to an agent that was supposed to uh, be proficient in VA. And it just wasn't the case. And the system was, it was, it was kind of broken. So um, the goal was to, from the get go, it was to build a company where we're masters at our craft and our craft is VA to help veterans, to help veterans better than they've ever been helped before to learn the system inside and out. And that's where it started. It was just throughout helping veterans that we found a need of so much greater than just real estate and, you know, helping veterans like what I've exp what, like what I experienced, you know, when you have the first sergeant, the staff sergeants that look out for you. And when you separate, you're on your own. So how can we be that first sergeant to these veterans that separate from service? How can we help guide them to square away their finances, teach them how to invest, help them get their military benefits, their VA disability benefits, the stuff that is so difficult for veterans to get. How can we be advocates for them and mentors to help guide them? So we, so we have this company where we just do anything and everything for veterans, whether we get paid or not. Like a lot of the stuff that we do is pro bono. And we help, vet, well, I've helped veterans start businesses. I've extended my network to them to help them get in a position that's better than where they met me at. Uh, RomeoEchoUSA.com. Uh, you can also find us on IG, Romeo Echo USA. We're on TikTok, um, pretty much every social channel, but yeah, Romeo Echo USA. Thanks for being here, Roland. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I got bad thoughts that make my mind scared. Hold me hostage and they don't fight fair. Who gon' pray for me and wipe on my tears? Who gon' save me if you not right here? Move this darkness and make my sight clear. Take me away, cause I don't like here. Ghost of my past, they feeling the night air. Wake me up, I'm trapped in my nightmares.